waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> The ladies not for turning. <laughs> Videos are getting longer and longer every week. This thing is rescheduled to the 8th of November, okay, because it's going to be tonight. And one of, the, one of the bankers, an MD at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, has had to have surgery today. So we knew about it yesterday, and he emailed me yesterday, which is why he had short notes. So not today, but on the 8th. I'm not sure how that works with internships. This is just a kind of, I don't know, I was going to say a networking event, but I hate that word, networking. But you get to meet these guys and talk to, talk to them. So who are they? There's, there's at least two MDs and one former MD from Merrill's, Goldman's, and Morgan Stanley. Plus their HR in tow, so you can ask questions. So, okay, but what we're doing today, we're talking about nationalisation causes and consequences. And I have done some of these for you. I haven't, probably haven't got enough. Well, I brought too many last week, so I, at great expense, I had to bring some back. And so the lecture will be in three sections, okay? So I've all the lectures so far, so I'm going to go out. So I'll just do that. So we're going to look at what it means, when it happened, and what the effects were. First we need to think about what it means. So what does nationalisation mean? It's a particularly British term, isn't it? Nationalisation. So what does it mean? Sid? Uh, the government buys the company or organisation um, and therefore it's, con it's controlled by the government. Okay, so state ownership. State ownership. State ownership. Okay, so that's, I mean, this is pre-1996, 95, can't remember. A Labour Party, the back of a Labour Party membership card. And on the back is, which you can't read because when I blew it up, it's kind of, <coughs> it lost definition, but it's down there. Anyway, to secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange, is what it says there, and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry or, or service. Clause 4, famously. That's the difference between labour and new labour, uh, a success for Tony Blair. But written by or drafted by Sydney Webb. What, what else did Sydney Webb do? I won't go back to, thank you Sid, but I won't go to you. Someone else, what else did Sydney Webb do? Anything? Where are we? <laughs> he founded what? He was, absolutely. He founded LSE. He founded LSE and also drafted clause for of the Labour Party Constitution, which is now no, no longer there. So, uh, nationalisation. So the transfer, good definition, uh, transfer of ownership and control from the private to the public sector. What is a nationalised industry? So it's an industry whose ownership and control have been transferred, as we said, to the public sector. An obvious example is the Royal Mail. However, think about this. Britain's largest firm by employment in 1907, twice as large as its nearest competitor, but it was never nationalised. It's always been in, initially in the state sector, but then in the public sector. We'll come back to that, what the difference might be. And some of the nationalised industries, so some industries weren't nationalised, and some weren't industries. They're just firms within industries. They, they happen to be a large slice of an industry sometimes, but they're still just firms, they're not industries. So some nationalised industries are not industries, and some of what we think of as nationalised industries weren't nationalised. A better term might be state-owned enterprises. And this is the current global Fortune 500, 2011, and 
Something I said a few weeks ago, by the way, was in the FT <coughs> yesterday. Did anyone see the front page of the FT yesterday? It just said two leading three uh, industry analysts had predicted that Volkswagen, who I think are, are number 13, will have a leapfrog Toyota by the end of this year. But if we look at Fortune 500, three, possibly four, so I'm not sure about this one, are state and enterprises. And this is quite unusual, okay? If you look, you, you can go into, into their website and scroll back different years, you will see fundamental change. Okay, so the three ch Chinese companies there are state-owned enterprises. That big. And Japan Post Holdings was privatized, I believe, in 2005-2006, but reversed in 2010, okay? So I believe it's still state sector. So 40% of the world's largest corporations buy revenue, okay, because there's different ways of, of doing this, and it, it, the table will look quite different if you, if you do profits or another way of looking at it. But by revenue, 40% of the world's largest top 10 companies, if that makes sense, are state owned enterprises. So, state owned enterprises, probably a better way of talking about nationalised nationalized industries. Nationalised industries. It tends to be a pejorative term, so it's, uh, it's used by the left and the right in different ways. But state-owned enterprises is more neutral. Okay, but implicitly at the beginning here, I, I, differ I differentiated when I talked about the post office between the state sector and a state-owned enterprise. Here's two, two other examples, I suppose. So, so Getra and the Forestry Commission. Now, the Forestry Commission last year went quite a long way down the road of being privatised. And this was, um, we just saw Margaret Thatcher, the lady's not for turning. Uh, well, David Cameron, the lady, well, is for turning because they didn't go through with that, okay? There was one of those popular uh, petitions of which we had one that led to a vote on Monday. On what? On Monday, it was a large government revolt. What was the vote on Monday? Came, which came from a hundred thousand people petitioning their MP. What was it? Sid, thank you very much. You've already contributed. Anyone, someone else at the back there. Sorry. Absolutely. Uh, not. That's not about being in the EU. Someone just refined that. Sorry. It was. It was about. Well, we should have a referendum on, on membership of the EU. Yes, it was about a referendum on the Labour people side, which is why you had UKIP in um, Parliament Square. Yeah. This was, Prussian Commission wasn't, or part of it was going to be privatised, but it's a state owned enterprise, as opposed to what used to be called the Ministry of Agriculture, which is part of the state, which has a minister. So I don't know what DETRA, what DETRA is called, DETRA, presumably, still, yeah, and, and it has a minister rather than a chief executive. So some easy examples differentiating between the state and state-owned enterprises are, uh, um, but look, the underground, London Underground, which is, which is clearly a state-owned enterprise, yeah? It, it has employees, and it's not part of the government, yeah? Whereas Her Majesty's Treasury is part of the state, it has a minister, there's a number of ministers, and it has advisors who are mostly civil servants, yeah, as opposed to... London Underground employees, and my brother says this is a London Underground suit, which I'm quite proud of, they don't think of themselves as civil servants, and they don't have civil servants' pensions. Civil service pensions. That's an easy example, the difference between London Underground being a state-owned enterprise and Her Majesty's Treasury. A slightly more difficult <coughs> one is job centres and employment agencies, okay? They do essentially the same thing. But one is part of the state, not a state-owned enterprise. And one is, is private. So, so there is a minister. So another difficult, a slightly more difficult example, and fairly obscure, unless you're Tim Loinick, whose wife works for GAD, is the government actuaries department. And they won, they administer, I believe they still administer, but every year they put in a tender to administer a part of, or maybe all of, NHS pensions. And in 2009, they won the award, a difficult year, yeah, pensions haven't generally done very well, particularly after 2008, they won Best Pension Scheme. But anyone else, Aon, could do this. A minor thing of what they do is advise the Chancellor, a very minor thing, I don't know, 2%, maybe less of their job. But most of their job is competing 
with the private sector to administer public sector pen pension schemes, one of which is the NHS, which is a huge pension scheme. Another difficult example, I suppose, is health and education. There's clearly a distinction here between private and public, but, there is, there, but there's a distinction also between the, a state-owned enterprise. Why is Chelsea and Westminster not a state-owned enterprise, rather than being part of the Department of Health? And similarly, education. I guess the distinction is where government sets or regulates demand and supply. That's when it is, is part of the state, as opposed to a state-owned enter enterprise, where government just regulates supply, but not demand. And let's look at this a bit more. So in education, government sets supply by deciding how many schools to run, by deciding how long we're in compulsory education, how many university places there are. So we're in compulsory education <coughs> from, I don't know, 4 to 18 now, isn't it? For people born after 1995. So for most of us, we were in compulsory education until we were 16. For the next cohort, it's until they're, until they're 18. And here, supply and demand. Here, government, not the consumer, is the master. And in the health service, the government <coughs> sets supply by deciding how many, how many hospitals there are, how many consultants there are, how many doctors there are, how many nurses there are. And government regulates demand by well, not demand of emergency treatment, that's very difficult to regulate, other than cues in A&E, but regulating demand for elective surgery. And again, it will do that by, by waiting lists. Parts of the state sector are where government regulates both demand and supply. State-owned enterprises are where government sets supply but not demand. And if we look at back at those Chinese and Japanese, the one... Get back to me on, on the Japanese Postal Service, will you? Is it still part of the state? I believe it is. It was split up into four, com into four companies as a stage towards privatisation, but I, I think it never happened. Government sets supply, but not demand. Actually, in the state sector, it does both. So, going back to BL and cars, during this period, government sets supply by determining how many, how many factories were kept open, how many people were employed in factories, generally production level, but it didn't determine demand. People were still free to buy other cars. They were free to buy Fords, they were free to buy Vauxhalls. They were less free periodically to buy imported cars because of tariffs. So government did have a, a small effect on demand, and government had an effect on demand through other ways as well, but let's just pretend it didn't. This was a period when BL was still in operation when, when taxation was quite high, and so there were other benefits, and one benefit was company cars. Well, company cars, there were a list of approved company cars, most of which were made in Britain. You couldn't decide to have a Volkswagen. But let's just assume that government regulates supply but not demand, because that, that becomes too... So it, it had a small role in regulating demand, but not a major role. There is no clock there, because I will give you a break at some stage, but not yet. Five more minutes. So the next section is, when did it happen? See here, I've actually said break here, but I think we'll, we'll go another five minutes. Picture of Gladstone, picture of various municipal buildings, NCP, National Coal Board, and a munitions factory at the NHS. In the 19th century, the post office, we've talked about this, so half of, bear in mind, the civil service in Gladstone period were quite big. We were administering an empire, not just a small collection of islands. But over half of Gladstone civil servants were postmen, and they were men. I haven't been politically incorrect there. You had to be a man to deliver post. The post office was separated from government only in 1969, Wilson, in the, during the Wilson government, and made a company with a, with, with a chief executive and not headed by a minister or a junior minister. So the 19th century there was the post office. There was also strategic goods, like military goods, and this even predates the 19th century. Britain generally is a believer in free trade, a believer in capitalism, but when, when there are really important things, it doesn't believe in the market quite so much. We, we talked, in the first lecture, we talked briefly about BSA, Birmingham Small Arms. The reason these manufacturers got together and formed Birmingham Small Arms was to compete with, with the Royal Arsenal, which was a state company and could afford large capital equipment. The, the small manufacturers in and in, in around the Midlands couldn't, so they clubbed together and joined together to, to compete against a state-owned enterprise. 
So that's what I'm talking, Royal Ordnance Factories are munitions factories. Royal Dockyards, all of this are strategic goods, and most of which, most of which were in the state sector. Also, 1914, Anglo-Persian, which is now what? What is Anglo-Persian now? BP. BP was nationalised. Nationalised by who? Does anyone know? By Churchill, I believe, by Winston Churchill. Why was it nationalised? Why is 1914 important? Oh, BP's already there, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I didn't see that. Yeah. <laughs> Neither did I. So why is 1914 important? First World War, yeah. But the First World War, oil is far from as strategic an input as it is subsequently. I mean, the First World War, particularly early on in the First World War, but the First World War is a war of horses, isn't it? Millions of horses. I can't remember how many millions of horses. But I don't know, 60 million horses died or something. So it's a war of horses. But the oil is really not as strategic as it seems. It seems obvious now, 1914, national British, uh, Britain's largest oil producer. But at the time, it seemed, it seemed strange. But anyway, 19th century, strategic parts of the economy are parts of, parts of the state or state-owned enterprises. In the interwar period, we see nationalisation or utilities becoming state-owned enterprises. <laughs> But this is generally local government, happening in local regions rather than a national government uh, initiative. The big one national government initiative is in electricity. Why? So externalities, we've all come across externalities. Why would externalities be important? Think about plumbing. I've done a bit of plumbing in my life, and plumbing sounds like it's quite a nice job, it's just connecting pipes and you run water through them. But plumbing is mostly not about that. Plumbing is about the other end of plumbing, yeah? It's not about the clean water, it's about the dirty water. So if we think of externalities, think about, think about old towns, old cities. Where do all the rich people live? Upstream. They live upstream, they live up the hill, don't they? They, they live on Hampstead, Hampstead Hill, they live on Richmond Hill, and the poor people, the smaller houses are down the bottom of the hill, aren't they? So, however rich you are, without, without the role of the state, the externality in plumbing is really quite obvious, isn't it? And the consequences of the free market are that there's a free market in the spirit spread of infection. So that the state gets involved, initially in plumbing, but beyond that in in the, in the other utilities, partly because of the, also because of the natural monopoly element, where it's cheaper for one firm to supply them to have competition, for them to have more than one firm. And the problems of private monopolies. So better the state to have that access to some of that dead weight loss, as it were, than, than the private sector. So this municipal socialism, as it's called, wasn't really municipal socialism. It was just it was municipal capitalism because these were firms that were run solely on capitalist lines. They raised money independently of the council, and they set salaries and strategies themselves. They weren't dictated to by government. But it's hard to find an example of this that fails. At that point, on the national grid, I'll give you. One minute break. I never said five minutes break. Five minutes break would be quite good. We'd all go out for coffee, but we would just we'd just have a minute. And you'll notice the clock that didn't work last week has gone now. So it said eight o'clock last week. Okay, so minute break. Yeah. This is my water. Yeah. No, thanks. Honest. honest. We were talking about externalities and. Uh, the honest is. Uh, okay. Okay, we, okay, that's about a minute. It would be nice to roll Mrs. T out again to certainly that she did she did the job very well early on. Okay, so a very obvious interwar success was the National Grid. Has anyone seen this? This was a series of three programs. Is it going to come up? Yeah. On BBC Four. 
the first one was really good. I didn't see that. They might be good too. But this gave you a history of, of the National Bridge, which was a, a real interwar period success. So Britain, the first industrial nation, this is all part of the second industrial revolution yeah, of electricity and chemicals and, and <coughs> consumer products and stuff. Britain really lags behind. You know, Berlin and Paris look very different to London with its gas lights in the interwar period. Has anyone ever experienced gas lighting? No. It's very, very di dim. And, uh, all of you have been outside of Western Europe and advanced industrial capitalist economies, though, haven't you? Has everyone? Yeah, and what do you notice when you walk around, generally, in cities and towns, in other parts of the world where they're not all linked up to a national grid and they don't, you know, they're not high income economies? What do you notice at night? It's very dark, isn't it? Very, very dark. Well, London, London looked like that. In, in the interwar period, London was very, very dark. I mean, gas lighting was, was around, but gas lighting is not very efficient. All our industrial competitors all look bright. So, this is a Conservative administration that effectively uh, uses a state-owned enterprise to link up the nation. And within 10 years, so you had all these little competing companies supplying electricity, supplying incompatible electricity. So a lot of you will come here and you'll need an adapter to use the UK power network, yeah? Well, this, was, this would be the case if you went to your neighbour's house three doors down the road until it was this kind of unified supply. There would be, there would be different supplies, a bit like the US. So one time you need a transformer, don't you, to be able to use US stuff in Europe, yeah, and vice versa. Okay, but within 10 years of the national grid, electricity price has gone down by 65%. So this, this was a huge success, but a success that some advanced industrial economies haven't followed. I mean, the US still doesn't have a national grid. And does, for you US students, does anyone come from the West Coast? Yeah, a few people come from the West Coast. Uh, do you still have outages there? Los Angeles, not very often. Los Angeles, not very often, but one of the richest places in the world still has outages. Why? Because you don't share your electricity. Is it, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, the national grid, where, where are the consumers of electricity in Britain? Most of them. London and the South East. Are there any uh, power uh, stations in London and the South East? No, there aren't. There were, but there aren't. There aren't anymore, okay? I think the last time they were used, the ones along the river, was during the miners' strike. Did uh, sorry? Did it Sorry? Does Didka count? I'm not sure if it can, but it can't. Anyway, it, it doesn't supply the whole of the South East. All the supply of electricity comes from elsewhere in Britain. And there is this, there is this amazing thing of pumping water upstream. Okay, Scottish Hydro. Okay, so Scottish, Scottish Hydro, because there was this thing during, uh, anyway, peak demands. There's kind of forecasting as to when peak supply will happen, okay? Uh, peak, sorry, peak demand. Uh, electricity is a strange thing. It's not like coal or wood where, where um, you can store it easily. Electricity, you can't store it. You can't store very easily, which is the whole problem of hybrid cars. But during, so predicting peak usage so it's a science, like, like weather predicting. But when they predict peak usage, they will then flow water down and use the turbines to then switch on huge amounts of supply to London and the South East. And it used to be called the, um, the Coronation Street uh, ad breaks. I don't know what it used to be called, but it used to be in between a peak program. Probably now it will be one of these dancing programs. What are they called? Does anyone know? Strictly, or one of these programs, yeah? So in the, uh, it's not an ad, right? Or is it a BBC program? It's a BBC program. So whenever this finishes and people all put their kettle on, this is when the water that had been pumped upstream during the night in Scotland, using electric, electric pumps, but when no one's, not many people are using electricity, is then pumped <coughs> downstream uh, for this brief period when, when there's a surge in demand. It is all about keeping the lights on, which is a problem in, in in Los Angeles sometimes. So national grid, huge success, conservative government initiated. It, it seems to us, maybe not so much to us, but a few years ago it seemed crazy why the state was seen as an efficient provider of goods and services. But again, put yourself in the context of 1945. We had this municipal socialism, okay, success, interwar period. We had 
failure of the markets in the interwar period. So capitalism didn't look like such a successful story. And we had, to some extent, the defeat of Nazi Germany by the state sector. Uh, not just Russia, but Britain. The British economy was, take, was, a, was a command economy. And to a certain extent, so was the US economy. Okay, Henry Ford said no to building liberators in his factories, but he didn't have a choice. The state, the state moved in, so this was a command economy. So the state had actually, had actually done pretty well. So by the time the Atlee administration comes in uh, with, a, with a landslide, it's easy to see why it looked like it was the solution. The Atlee administration was a hugely uh, uh, ambitious government, but it had no money. We've already been there. We had no money. So Britain's bread hangs on Lancashire's thread. All of this stuff, Austin's the dollars, okay? And yet they wanted to do so much. And they did do so much, okay? They created, as we know, the National Health Service, the welfare state, as we know it, both of which survived. But they also nationalised an awful lot of firms, thousands of firms. The National Health Service and aspects of the welfare state still survive. Few of these firms survive in the public sector. Pretty much all now, all now private. That's the interwar period. So we've got the 19th century, the interwar period, and the immediate post-war period. Later nationalisations were generally lame ducks. And before Margaret Thatcher, the ladies not for turning, started privatising, she was nationalising, yeah? She was taking firms into the state sector before, before the term privatisation was even thought about. And these lame ducks were com companies that were just seen as being too big to fail but which otherwise would have failed. So the, the obvious example is British Lane, but we've got Rolls-Royce, we've got many, many others, and more recently, we've got the banks, haven't we? Okay, just to sum up that section, 19th century security, interwar period municipality, war kind of pragmatism, post-war ideology, socialism, calls for and all of that. 1970s and the 2000s, kind of crisis management, lame ducks. What were the effects of nationalisation? So most firms did much better afterwards than they had done before. But then, what, what are we comparing it with? Okay, so post-45, golden age of economic growth, 1945 to 1973, most firms did better than they had done before. What had they done before? Okay, so 1939 to 1945, war. 1929 to 1939, you know, not a great period. I mean, great actually for the South and for consumer products, but not great for old industries. So that doesn't, although they've done much better than before, it doesn't actually tell us very much. Underneath, sort of masked by the golden age of economic growth, within the state sector, you had stagnation. The, the mergers were just too big to handle. So in 1948, the largest firm was National Coal, which employed nearly a million people. The National Coal Board employed nearly a million people, 700,000 people. The British. British Electricity Authority, where you see British before a firm's name, it generally was in the state sector. So the British Electricity Authority was the simultaneous merging, so an overnight merging of 550 separate privately owned firms. The gas merger, so British gas, is British gas there? No, British gas isn't there. Was, was the merger of a thousand firms. And road haulage, road haulage we called well, whatever Red Horns was called, but that was the merge of 3,800 firms, which included, you know, one man and his van. And then you suddenly merged into the National, National Haulage Corporation. And so the, these were big mergers, and we've seen the consequences of these kind of big, these big mergers in the car industry, yet yeah? mergers without rationalisation. So the state, state owned enterprise employed, as we saw in the car industry. Okay, they employed a lower ratio of managers to workers, much lower ratio of managers to workers than in the private sector. And managers were given no incentives or kind of mixed incentives, okay? It wasn't clear what they were supposed to do. Were they supposed to raise productivity? Were they supposed to increase employee benefits? Were they supposed to increase employment? Were they supposed to save the state money? Were they supposed to keeping inflation down. There was no clear sign on what good management was. The obvious, I suppose, example of stagnation is the greatest monopoly profit is an easy life. Who's heard that before? 
No one? Okay, it was John Hicks. So John Hicks uh, was a teacher at LSE. Okay, so the greatest monopoly profit is an easy life. 1960s, the Treasury starts getting involved. And we see the beginnings of something that we don't see in the car industry, but we do see in the rail industry. We see the beginnings of rationalisation. The rail network doesn't look that different now from 1984. Okay, so you've got, well, soon, we have, we've got a whole, lots of holes in the ground at the moment. Soon you'll have crossrail, and you've got the, the channel link, haven't you? Um, but beyond that, that's kind of what it looks like now. But that's what it looked like in 1963. Beecham came in, he was an engineer, worked for ICI. Before that, he'd been in, in the military. But he was an engineer in the military. Uh, he came in, he's not an economist, bear in mind. Okay? He's an engineer. I believe he's a chemical engineer. Anyway, he comes in and rationalises the rail network. So, and this, although it's still kind of controversial now, this actually seems to make sense. It makes an awful lot of sense. We go back to this picture here. This is a British Rail advert in 1960 to the village my mother comes from. But the rail, the nearest rail link had closed the year before this advert came out. So Beachy came in, did the big sweeping closures, but, but the, the war, there was the beginning of rationalisation early on, mostly because Britain had, Britain had started this and it just, and this is, this is the result of not a failed state enterprise, but the private sector. Lots of competing firms competing for rail business. Rail business that just wasn't there, and increasingly wasn't there anymore. HM Treasury to the rescue. The other thing the Treasury did was it initiated more sensible pricing. Coal was a good example of this. There were much more sensible prices. And it was based on investment decisions and big changes in the coal industry in the 1960s. The 1960s coal industry is pre-power tools, yeah? So pre-pneumatic tools, pre-electrification. It's still pit ponies, okay? Big investment but sensible prices. Sensible prices for coal output. But who's paying the prices? Who are the, who are the biggest consumers of coal in the 1960s once the Treasury says, okay, we need to have market prices for coal? So it'll be other state sector companies. It'll be British Steel, it'll be British Leyland, and it'll be the National Power companies. Again, the state sector. So the state sector will be paying those higher prices. OK, we'll come back to joined up government. But we did see, we did see with these changes, this is 1960s, OK, pit pony. We did see, and this is 1960s as well, uh, a pick and a shovel. Okay, coal mining with a pick, pick and shovel. It's not until the 60s that you get uh, mass electrification in the coal industry. Okay, almost when the coal industry is, you know, uh, is, is no longer relevant. But as a consequence of this, you do see massive rises in productivity. Okay, to the extent that Richard Pryke, I believe, a respected academic, a respected academic from the free market area of economics, so not sympathetic to the state sector, in 1971, at the end of this period of investment and shake-up within the state sector, had said that the problems of, of state-owned firms had essentially been solved. So in 1971, this is what he said. So was he right? Well, we kind of, we kind of think that maybe he wasn't right, because the, then the 1970s hit us, and what did we have in the 1970s? We had inflation, and so the state, state-owned enterprises were, were told by the government to hold prices down. This leads to losses, yeah? So prices are rising everywhere else, but this huge state sector is told to keep prices down. So you get poor quality, and managers just try and cut costs. Okay, so that's when you, that's when you start looking at and seeing some of, the, some of the poor output from the British state sector. The other thing that happens in the 1970s as well uh, and the U-turn that Thatcher is alluding to in the video at the beginning is Edward Heath's U-turn in 1972 with the budget, with the, uh, with the budget which pumped money into the state sector because of the fear of unemployment. And can you believe what he was frightened of? Edward Heath, Prime Minister in 1972. What levels of unemployment was he, fri was he frightened of? Total unemployment. So what's unemployment now? Total. Anyone know? It's, it's relevant for us to know, and me to know. 
Right, so I'm not looking at the percentage, sort of overall. So, cause I, only because I can't remember the percentage uh, in 1972, but I can remember the number. The big magic number was unemployment was reaching a million. Uh, David Cameron would love to get unemployment somewhere near there, wouldn't he? But Edward Heath was frightened of unemployment of a million. What is this, what is this poster here? Sarge and Sarge. Sarge and Sarge, absolutely. So with rising unemployment, the state sector have been told to keep prices down, have also been told to keep employment up. Uh, how are you going to do that? You know, something's got something to break, hasn't it? If you've been told to maintain employment levels and keep prices down, it's just not going to work. And so this leads to massive, massive losses in productivity and in quality of output. Joined up now. to maintain employment, the state sector bought products from the state sector. The post office was the biggest customer for BL commercial vehicles. Police didn't have a choice of what vehicles to buy, and they bought British vehicles, British, British laden vehicles generally. And the Queen. Um, but what does the Queen drive now? What's this vehicle here? So this was joined up government, supposedly. So what is this vehicle here? It's a Rolls Royce. It's not a Rolls Royce, but something like it. It's a Bentley. Who owns Bentley? Volkswagen. Yeah, well done. We have, so, so the Queen. The Queen no longer has to drive a British car. Okay, so something has to break, doesn't it? Something has to break. And the other thing you have with this breakage is you have a change of philosophy, and the change of philosophy that comes along with with this with Margaret Thatcher and the end of butzkerism. Okay, the end of this kind of consensus in a mixed economy, in a welfare state, and full employment, okay? Full employment, suddenly, 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 unemployment is no longer something to be frightened of, but something to be used as a tool, potentially, yeah? What does the state sector get? Well, it gets told to act commercially, and told in, in no uncertain terms, and it's about rationalisation. And this is a period of renaissance for the state sector. Productivity then grows very, very fast. Very, very fast. But it grows fast because what's happening? The long tail is just chopped off. This is Ian McGregor, okay? He was first appointed by Callaghan at British Labour. Well, not Callaghan personally, but the, the Callaghan government, 1977, he went to British Labour. And then Keith Joseph, kind of philosoph philosophical mentor to Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher hadn't discovered the benefits of supply-side economics until she met Keith Joseph. Uh, Keith Joseph appointed him to British Steel, and then famously he goes to uh, the National Coal Board. But going back to British Steel, the changes initiated at British Steel were hugely successful, but they amount to massive closures, yeah? Massive closures, but it, but it went from this basket case in the 1970s that was told to keep prices down and keep employment up to Joint, jointly the most successful, most productive steel operation in the world. However, what's the story now? Who owns what was British Steel now? See, what did British Steel become? Um, they became Chorus. They became Chorus. It was bought up by uh, an Indian conglomerate. An Indian conglomerate called Tata. Called Tata, absolutely, yeah. Okay, but it was turned around in the 1980s. And Margaret Thatcher herself appointed Ian McGregor, but kind of, kind of regretted it. I guess the Thatcher government asked themselves, well, what was the point of a firm being owned by the state if, if it needs to act like any other capitalist firm? Partly for ideological reasons, but mostly because they didn't have any money. They replaced nationalisation with denationalisation, and then found a name for denationalisation, which was which was privatisation, and which we'll do next week. But just to sum up this third part, periodisation, when we're talking about state-owned enterprises, about nationalisation, is important. It's not all a basket case. But the golden age kind of mass stagnation, so 1945 to the early 70s. In the 1960s, the government gets, gets involved via the Treasury in some forms of rationalisation and in initiating kind of market prices. 1970s, employment stagflation, and this is not philosophically, this is not ideology, this is, this is the government. I mean, BL wasn't nationalised until the mid-1970s. Yeah, the state had been involved in the amalgamation, in the merger of firms, but not in ownership. 
And then 1980s Thatcherism. And the 2000s, more lame ducks, maybe. Come back next week for privatisation.